1999's The Matrix is arguably one of the most influential movies ever made. The film depicts the journey of a disgruntled protagonist who is unsatisfied with life as he explores a dystopian future where humanity is controlled by machines and is unknowingly trapped inside a simulated reality. The film is riddled with subtle yet poignant anti-capitalist, anti-establishment messages which were confirmed by the directors Lily and Lana Wachowski. As in 2020, Lily Wachowski details that the film was born out of rage at capitalism, its oppressive structures, the cooperative society leading to work alienation, hyper-individualism, and further social atomization. However, I think The Matrix is one of those films that, no matter how many times you watch it, you would still be able to pick up on something new and further theorize on what it might mean and symbolize. One of the most popular theories of The Matrix, especially after both the Wachowski sisters came out as trans, was that The Matrix is an allegory for being transgender in a society that was not yet liberal and progressive enough to accept queerness. This theory was validated by Lily Wachowski, and honestly, after you learn about this theory, it is hard to unsee how it is portrayed throughout the film. From a general sense of malice, Neo feels at the start of the film that is described by Morpheus like a splinter in your mind, symbolizing gender dysphoria. The character Switch, who would be a man in the real world but a woman in the Matrix, how as the agents chase down Neo, they continue to refer to him as Mr. Anderson, representing the dead naming of a trans person. And of course, the iconic red pill scene, based off the feminizing hormones that were available in the 90s, Premarin, which was a literal red pill. However, if you have been on the internet since 2014, or in particular, if you have been following the anti-feminist, anti-SJW trend to the more left-leaning, bread tube side of YouTube, you would know that the red pill refers to something completely different. The red pill in today's climate refers to a term coined by the incels, short for involuntary syllabus. The term incel comes from a website called Lana's Involuntary Celibacy Project created back in the 90s for people struggling with loneliness and intimacy at a time where social media and the internet was barely at its infancy. However, the movement was soon hijacked by groups of lonely, mostly heterosexual men centering on forums like incels.is to complain about women. However, the incels are merely one part of the broader online group known as the Manosphere, consisting of other subgroups like the pickup artists, men's rights activists or MRAs, and the voluntary slippets of MGTOW, short for men going their own way. For the Manosphere, taking the red pill refers to coming to a realization that the society functions on a gynocentric system where women and other minorities hold all the power. In the case for incels especially, it is actually women who have power over men by withholding them sex. However, the concept of taking the red pill has been adopted by the alt-right and the conservative movement to reflect society as a whole, where feminism and other progressive movements are seen as the roots to all evil. Because apparently there is no greater revelation than misogyny. Over the years, the incels have become a punching bag for the internet to laugh at due to their pathetic nature. However, I do want to stress that this movement is far more insidious than just few emasculated men whining about women online. This resentment that the incels have towards women has led to several mass shootings, to the point Wikipedia has now included an entire timeline dedicated to violence attributed by incels. In 2016, a documentary was released by Cassie J that was literally titled The Red Pill, exploring the depths of the men's rights movement. While the documentary brings up legitimate issues that men face under patriarchy, like dismissal of fathers' rights at divorce courts and high mortality rate, it does so while shunning feminism and women. You hear about patriarchy, right? All the evils of the world's from patriarchy, but we're the ones dying, you know? And we die for you guys. Now, before anyone comes at me, I understand that art is subjective. You know, two people can look at, say, the exact same painting and come out taken away two completely different meanings from it, which is one of the reasons why the Wachowskis tend to remain quiet when it comes to 
theories and speculations about the Matrix franchise as they want the audience to come up with the meanings themselves. You make a work of art and you want it to be provocative. You want people to dialogue about right. it. You don't want them to rely on somebody to tell them what it is. Or, right. It's like the whole nature of the movie is exactly that. Right. Exactly. Perspective and pursue it yourself. However, when it is this different, as in the dissonance between what it's supposed to be versus how it's interpreted, you know something has gone wrong here. The fact that they named a men's movement after estrogen pills, I mean, the irony of that has not been lost on me, and that is what I want to talk about. It got to the point Lily Wachowski herself has lashed out publicly at Republicans for twisting its meaning. In fact, with the rising emergence of the old white movement over the past couple of years, with many of its key figures referring to the process of radicalization as taking the red pill, the latest movie in the franchise called The Matrix Resurrections included subtle messages directly addressing this disconnect. It starts off very similar to the original but presents the choice between the pills as a mere illusion. You call this a choice? Oh, honestly, when somebody offered me these things, I went off on binary conceptions of the world and said that there was no way I was swallowing some symbolic reduction in my life. And the woman with the pills laughed because I was missing the point. What point? The choice is an illusion. You already know what you have to do. In this video, I want to explore how the alt right takes pieces of media that are often direct critiques of fascism, capitalism, and authoritarianism, and manipulate their meanings to make them out to be something completely different that is at the other end of the political spectrum. I will be focusing more on the movies that are picked on by the alt-right. I don't really have a genre or a category to lump these movies in, aside from calling them edgelord movies or we live in a society movies, but you know, these are the movies that typically feature a disgruntled male protagonist working at a dead-end office job. Although there are some exceptions to this, usually the protagonist feels a general dissent that something is wrong with the world, thus feeling unsatisfied with life, displaying a sense of nihilism, with a few anti-establishment messages sprinkled in between. There are plenty of movies that fit this narrative, some of the notable ones being Fight Club, The Matrix, as we have already discussed, and of course, <sighs> the Joker, which I will get to, unfortunately. The biggest irony here is that, like I said, these movies often serve to critique the very system that the right wants to protect and conserve, yet they're hailed as these masterpieces, with certain aspects not just promoted, but romanticized. Part 1. We... <sighs> Aside from misconstruing these movies, one of the things that has bothered me for a very long time is how characters that are supposed to be satirical or serve as a critique or a warning are often idealized and glamorized as someone to look up to. Tyler Durden from Fight Club is a prime example of this. Based on the novel by Chuck Palahniuk, the 1999 film directed by David Fincher follows your typical disgruntled male protagonist dissatisfied with his life under consumerism, until he meets a mysterious extremist named Tyler Durden, with whom he starts an underground fight club, which soon turns into something destructive as the members engage in subversive acts of vandalism and other forms of terrorism, forming a cult-like organization. Since the release of the film, Chuck Palahniuk has come out as gay, so it can be theorized that Fight Club was really written for the author to come into grips with his sexuality, as there are many parts of the text that can be analyzed through a queer lens. But for me, even as I watched Fight Club for the first time with no prior knowledge, it seemed to be a critique of postmodern masculinity. In contrast to the narrator, Tyler Durden is everything he wants to be, yet is the complete opposite of it. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. He depicts such an idealized version of masculinity to the point it almost feels satirical. He is confident, charismatic, detached. The only significant female character that this film has is Marla Singer, whom he repeatedly has aggressive casual sex with, followed by emotional neglect. However, it is these traits, when taken to the extreme, led to destruction and death. 
Yet, when you look up anything regarding Fight Club, especially Tyler Durden, you are bound to find people who idealize him and look up to him as the desired version of masculinity. Now, I'm not saying that you can't enjoy these characters. I, for one, loved Tyler Durden. However, there is a difference between simply enjoying something versus idealizing it. There are edits made of him, people putting him on a pedestal as this cinema male, naming their child after him, emulating him to the best of their abilities, from his charisma to his haircut to even his style of walking. Look at how Brad Pitt walks here, exuding confidence. And particularly look at his shoulder, swiveling left and right. This is a trait you will see in almost every alpha male. My guy, he, he's not real. And I don't just mean it in a sense that he is a fictional character, but a majority of these men who look up to Tyler Durden seem to forget about the scene where the narrator realizes that he was never real, rather he was just a fragment of the narrator's imagination caused by hallucinations due to his insomnia, and the scene at the end where he manages to kill Tyler by pointing the gun at himself. The entire second half of the film, where Tyler's magnetism is used to recruit a self-destructive cult called Project Mayhem, seemed to get brushed under the carpet by these people. Fight Club was really supposed to serve as a warning to men, how the seemingly desirable masculine traits can lead to destruction when taken to the extreme and the dangers of waking up to the realization of the superficial, materialist and consumerist nature of society underlaid capitalism. But in between Brad Pitt's incredible acting, the engaging plotline and cinematography, the true meaning seemed to have been lost and now it's been recontextualized to serve the old right as Andrew Anglin, neo-Nazi and editor of the white supremacist website The Daily Stormer, hailed it as the greatest movie ever made. Also, fun fact, the term snowflake actually originated from Fight Club, but it was not to describe the liberal social justice warriors from college campuses as we know today, but to refer to these men at Fight Club who were fed this lie of them being unique and special only for their bubble to burst into adulthood. Listen up, maggots. You are not special. You are not a beautiful or unique snowflake. You are the same decaying organic matter as everything. Another more recent example of this is 2019's The Joker, played by Joaquin Phoenix. Directed by Todd Phillips, the film attempts to humanize one of the most stereotypical cartoonish villains of The Joker by portraying him as a broken man failed by society. The film's protagonist, Arthur Fleck, is a party clown and an aspiring stand-up comedian living with his frail mother in crime-ridden and economically stagnant Gotham City. Throughout the film, Arthur Fleck is treated like an outcast by those around him due to his erratic nature caused by mental illnesses, as the society continues to shun him, including the social services that cut off his medications that he needed to survive. He eventually snaps and embraces a life of chaos, seeking revenge upon those who wronged him. Again, just like Tyler Durden, perhaps even more so, Arthur Fleck is not somebody you are supposed to be looking up to. If anything, he is somebody you are supposed to sympathize with, a social reject who needed support and care. Yet, especially after the release of the 2019 film, there was a huge emergence of this fandom this motivational joker community directed towards young men, from sharing quotes to edits to Sigma Male Grant said part 13. The trend has somewhat died down since, but there are still some out there that can be found that is pretty recent. The fact that there are so many people, young men in particular, who can not only relate to the joker, but look up to him, worship him, and hail him as this hero, is concerning, to say the least. And I get that most of it is probably just edgy humor hiding behind irony, but as the saying goes, there is a grain of truth behind every joke. This got so big that the Warner Brothers had to step in and put out a statement condemning gun violence in society. Closer to its release date, the theaters premiering the Joker had to ramp up their security, and some theaters decided to stop premiering it altogether. As I briefly mentioned at the start, it is not just the movies that are misconstrued and recontextualized to fit this edgelord or we live in a society narrative that almost always leads into the alt-right pipeline. 
In fact, all sorts of media or internet culture as a whole, from TV shows to cartoons or even memes, can be hijacked to promote a certain narrative. In 2020, a documentary titled Feels Good Man was released that was directed by Arthur Jones. The documentary features Matt Fury, an underground cartoonist and the creator of Pepe the Frog, and explores how this innocuous cartoon became a symbol of bigotry and hate. What do people get wrong about drawing Pepe? Um, probably when they put Pepe on the internet saying, like, kill Jews. After being co-opted by the right, Websites like 4chan and Reddit made their own versions of Pepe to fit their agenda. Usually that involved anti-Semitic portrayals of Pepe with references to Hitler, Nazi Germany and the Jews. Pepe became a hate symbol. It was listed as one on the Anti-Defamation League. The nature of media and politics is stuff that I've been trying to escape from my entire life as an artist. Like I don't give a shit about any of that stuff and then I got pulled into it just because I'm on a hate symbol database list now, and it pissed me off. In 2018, Unite the Right rally was held in Charlottesville, Virginia for white supremacists and neo-Nazis. That led to a car attack causing one casualty and 35 injured. The participants of this rally showed up with swastika and confederate flags, alongside drawings and signs of Pepe the Frog. I do realize that by this point of the video, it may sound like that I'm blaming these pieces of media for all the hate and harm they cause, but the truth is, this level of hatred and bigotry is far too large to be pointed to one creator or a single movie or a meme. It's not that these movies gave birth to the incel movement or the alt-right movement or any of these dangerous hate groups but rather the hate was already there to begin with. And having these pieces of media, even if their origins point to something completely different, only fooled the fire that was already there. Part 2. It is not the movies. I feel like this disclaimer should have been made at the start of the video, but whenever a tragedy like mass shooting occurs, we tend to point to external forces like the media. A couple years ago, it was video games. During the Columbine era, it was goth music, Marilyn Manson, and now it is incel movies like The Joker. And I get the appeal of it. I understand why some people may believe that it is this violent media that is causing violence. You know, a lot of people immediately go looking for a reason, something to put blame on whenever tragedies like this occur. It is a simple, reductive explanation, a scapegoat essentially. It is a lot easier to turn to something more tangible, like a controversial film, than it is to address something that is broader, more complicated, abstract like society and its flaws, especially for older generations who may not be very well versed when it comes to technology and media, and this is especially true if you live in a gerontocracy where older people hold more power in a society. Typically, people do tend to be afraid of the things that they do not understand. Also, generally speaking, like I said, it is a lot easier to point to external forces than it is to look within ourselves. However, if you were to actually look into the data and research conducted in this area, some of which I'll have linked below, the likelihood of crime almost always falls down to predictable factors. Things like family behavior, socioeconomic status, past criminal behavior, access to guns. I mean, the fact that people were so wary of this new Joker film a couple years ago to the point Warner Brothers had to step in, security were ramped up, Yet, there were barely any occurrence of violent behavior after its release, aside from some few edgy posts on forums, is pretty telling in itself. The Joker is like the poster boy for edgelord lone wolf terrorism that everyone likes to point to. But to this day, there is not a single mass shooter who has been confirmed to have been motivated by the Joker to commit violence. In 2012 Aurora shooting that happened during the screening of Batman's Dark Knight Rises, there were some rumors that the shooter was motivated by the Joker, apparently he was dressed as one, but all he did was dye his hair red, even though Joker has green hair. The attorney that persecuted him has come forward and said that there were no such thing. 
the shooter has never thought of himself or referred to himself as the Joker. Him dyeing his hair was just a little thing he did with his friend. And the choice of the screening of Batman's Dark Knight Rises was because it was guaranteed to be full. If it were screening any other popular franchise like Jurassic World or The Avengers or whatever, he would still be there. Yet, to this day, the rumor still persists. And there are people who still point to the Joker or these movies as a whole for violence. Now, I'm not denying that the media can play a role in influencing our perceptions and behavior. But in this case, it is not so much that the media is causing people to have these nihilistic and establishment ideas, rather it is the experiences of people inspiring these creations who likely had a lot of these ideas to begin with, and the media is just there to simply affirm and validate those beliefs. We see it's not just the memes generate the violence. It's that the violence becomes a meme. But it's just a joke, right? It's just a stupid frog. If you know anything about me, you would know that I don't like being superficial. If there is an issue, I think it's important to look at it from all angles and get down to the root cause rather than hyper-focusing on one aspect. In this case, since most of these movies are directed towards men, and most of the mass shooters are men, I think it is important to look into that. If we want to prevent the next mass shooting or any other forms of law and wolf terrorism from happening in the future, we have to address the root cause of how men are raised and perceived in this society. We have to look within ourselves instead of pointing to some abstract, nebulous piece of media, and that would require for us to ask ourselves some pretty difficult, hard-hitting, uncomfortable questions. For the remainder of this video, I want to attempt to explore this topic to the best of my abilities. For the record, I am by no means trying to defend or justify the actions of the shooters. I just want to take an objective look into who they are or where and why are they like this. Why do men even get pulled into these circles in the first place? What caused them to have the beliefs that they do? And more importantly, why are they so angry? Part 3. The Masculinity Crisis Sociologist Michael Kimmel introduces quite a peculiar concept that is unique to men, in particular white men, to which he calls aggrieved entitlement. In his book, Angry White Men, Kimmel describes aggrieved entitlement as something that seeks to restore, to retrieve, to reclaim something that is perceived to have been lost. Simply put, middle-class white men, in particular American white men, have been fed a lie of meritocracy, the American dream since childhood, whether it be in history books as founding fathers or comic books as superheroes, they have been told that hard work and dedication is all you need to succeed, to gain respect, and thus live a fulfilling life. But in the state of late capitalism, the exploitative machine that chews you up and spits you out, that couldn't be further from the truth. Maybe in the boomer generation, hard work is really all you needed, but now hard work is only exploited. I mean, if hard work is really all you needed to succeed, every African woman would have been at least a millionaire by now. And as these men reach adulthood and enter the workforce, they are slowly waking up to the fact that the world is not what they expected it to be. It's not what they were promised. This causes them to feel a sense of oppression, regardless of whether it is legitimate or not. They believe that the system is stacked against them. Theirs is the anger of the entitled. They were entitled to those jobs, those positions of unchallenged dominance. And when they were told they were not going to get them, they get angry. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. We're slowly learning that fact. We're very, very pissed off. Before I go on, I want to briefly address that since the release of his book, Kimmel has been accused of sexually assaulting one of his graduate students, which is ironic given how he included an entire chapter on how men take out their anger on women through sexual violence. While I obviously do not condone any of that, his work still stands and is especially relevant to this topic, so I will be referring to it for the rest of this video. 
But aside from Tala Durton, for me the best example of a grieved entitlement comes from a rather lesser known movie released in 1993 called Falling Down. Directed by Joel Schumacher, Falling Down portrays the protagonist played by Michael Douglas, William Defense Foster's descent into madness and chaos triggered by unemployment. While it is unknown what Foster's job used to be, it was vaguely alluded that he used to work for the US military to help produce nuclear weapons for the Cold War. Regardless of the ethics of his job, Foster really took a lot of pride in his work. He even had a customized license plate reflecting his job and he genuinely believed that he was doing something good for the world by serving his country. But ultimately, when the Cold War ended and globalization tightened up during the Clinton era, none of this mattered to his employers who no longer needed him and let him go. His hard work and dedication meant nothing to these ruthless, soulless corporations who ultimately did not care about Foster and thousands of employees like him. But going back to 4chan and the alt-right, I think this phenomena of aggrieved entitlement is especially relevant in those circles. In some chan boards like Paul, the average 4chan user goes by the label of NEET, which is an acronym for not in education, employment or training. These are your stereotypical neckbeards, living in their mom's basement, unemployed and filling their time with video games and porn and posting reactionary content on 4chan. Some have lived this lifestyle for years, especially with the pandemic where people were forced to stay inside. Many suffered from several mental illnesses, unsurprisingly, and have, for the most part, been rejected and outcasted by society. These are or were the bullied kid, the quiet kid, or at least they perceived themselves as that way, building a deep sense of resentment towards society as a whole. To these people who have spent most of their lives feeling miserable, the concept of male privilege or white privilege is absurd, regardless of how true it may be. However, this sense of isolation is not something that is unique to this subgroup of men, the needs of 4chan, but it seems to be the case for men all across the board to the point it is a part of the male condition. A recent study investigating how young adults explore their identity found that women on average tend to adopt identity moratorium, meaning they are more likely to be open to exploring who they are and could be, whereas men adopt identity foreclosure, ideas of what they should be, already thinking they know who they are without exploring any other options. This somewhat explains why patriarchy is so limiting for men, hence the classic saying, masculinity is a cage. And since this foreclosure of masculinity only allows for two or three emotions for men to express publicly without societal backlash, it is not hard to see how that can lead to social isolation. A while back, this Tumblr post created by a trans man exploring this topic went viral. The post outlines how male socialization typically lacks a sense of camaraderie as opposed to female friend groups, except for in really specific circumstances like in war or contact sports. When you present masculine in public, people either fear you or ignore you completely. And while there is good reason for that, especially for women, it can serve as a protective armor. I have done it myself before. But if you don't know about that, if you don't have significant female influence in your life, it can be alienating. Going through life with everyone being aloof and distant towards you, giving you the cold shoulder, can feel like the world is against you and everyone has it in for you. This feeling of alienation is so innate to the male condition that most men can't even put this feeling into words, like there's a reason as to why this post came from a trans man. To be fair, all these things that I talked about can also help men push onto left to be more progressive. Say, with the entitlement, some men can extend this understanding to women and other minorities and realize that they were never made that promise, which can help put things into perspective. And this social isolation and alienation is really a product of toxic masculinity, something that feminists have been raving on about for years. However, given how the algorithm works, especially on YouTube, it is so, so much easier to get sucked into the manosphere. Part 4. The Manosphere 
the manosphere, consisting of incels, pickup artists, men's rights activists, and in general, cis hetero male centric online groups, have always gotten a bad rep for being misogynistic and overall toxic. And while I'm not denying that there are some aspects that are definitely questionable, from the research that I've done, most of Manosphere seems pretty harmless in our core stuff catered towards men. It is actually a loud minority of the group touting out most of its reactionary aspects, and from the outside looking in, it can seem like the entirety of Manosphere is like this. But most of it is just self-help stuff catered towards men, from workout routines to fashion tips, hustling, generic advice on how to be more confident. And while there is value in that, I personally don't get it. Most of it still seems like generic advice that is either common sense or stuff that you've probably heard a million times before, but then again, it's probably not for me. The entry points of Manosphere lures young men in by tapping into their insecurities, addressing their loneliness, isolation, and pretty much tells them that if you act and look a certain way, attract women, make a certain amount of money, achieve a high status in society, most if not all of your problems will dissipate. And more importantly, for $1.99 a month, you can get my free course linked in the description, as well as a guide on how to pick up women, testosterone cream, on my website. And again, I see the value in that. I can understand why some people might find it useful, but there is no guarantee that reaching this high status will lead to a fulfilling life in the long term, especially if you suffer from underlying issues like undiagnosed mental illnesses. Say with wealth, for example, the data is pretty clear that after a certain point, the rate of happiness plateaus with income. In contrast to the We Live in a Society movies that I mentioned earlier, there are also plenty of movies that explore the lives of men who have made it in society's standards, yet are deeply unhappy, some of which are based on true stories. For me, though, the most notable example of this comes from former pickup guru Neil Strauss. The pickup community refers to a movement of men whose goal is to seduce and have success with women. In the early 2000s, when pickup artistry was at its peak, Neil Strauss wrote his book The Game, which is considered to be one of the foundational texts of pickup artistry to this day. After its success, Strauss became famous, made a ton of money, got women, had his own TV show, and was overall living the high-value lifestyle that is idealized for men. But behind the scenes, Strauss's life was in shambles. He struggled with sex addiction, monogamy, cheated on his partner, and eventually ended up discrediting everything in the game and wrote a follow-up book titled The Truth, where he warns men against this glamorous lifestyle. So you've had a change of heart. I'm bigger than that, I can, a complete transformation yeah. as to kind of who I was and what I thought was important to who I am now. And what brought that about? Um, I guess sometimes you have to hit a real low. And for me, it was meeting someone I cared about, being really in love with this person, or so I thought. Mm -hmm. Then cheating on her, getting caught, and you know, breaking the heart of someone who loves you and hurting her that much that I started to think, well, maybe I'm just completely wrong about everything. But most men who find value in the manosphere do not usually stay in it for too long. And like I said, on its surface level, it's really not that bad and can even be useful if all you're after is some generic advice on how to talk to women. But for the ones who stay, they slowly get sucked into its more toxic and pernicious aspects, and subsequently, the rhetoric also shifts to being more reactionary and provocative. Now they tap into the entitlement by going, yes, you are entitled to those things, you are deserving of those things, but the reason you don't have it is because women. You know, the evils of modern women. You were supposed to have that job, you were meant to be in that position of power, but the reason you don't is because feminism allowed women into the workforce reducing the price of labor, affirmative action favoring blacks over whites, and immigrants stealing your jobs. And that is the red pill in a nutshell. The idea that it is actually women and other minorities who hold all the power in society and are conspiring against men. As you spiral down this rabbit hole further and further, 
it leaves you feeling angry, perhaps angrier than you initially started with. Now they're talking about all these outlandish ideas on how to fix society, including enforced monogamy, sexual Marxism, and in general, wanting to subjugate and take rights away from women. The red pill becomes the black pill, which essentially refers to accepting your faith that you'll never be enough, no women will ever want you, and you're better off just lying down and watch. All this spirals you down to a state of nihilism which is a common trait found in almost every mass shooter. While people get to this point for various reasons, some do so due to sexual frustration, or constantly being ostracized by society, or hatred towards a particular group, but if you actually read through their manifestos, almost all of them have two things in common. First is the sense of entitlement that I mentioned earlier, and nihilism. This deep existential belief that nothing matters, the world is just broken beyond repair, and the only way to fix it is to start over by destroying everything and everyone in it. Some might get hurt, but hey, you, you wanna, wanna make, make an omelette, you gotta break some eggs. Although I spoke about how this movie is on their own shouldn't be blamed for violent crimes, I can't help but to feel as if they glamorize this idea quite a bit, whether it is intended or not. Destroying the society is often portrayed as equivalent to pressing the reset button. And the craziest thing is, I can still get where they're coming from to an extent. Like I said, it is a lot easier to point to external forces than it is to look within yourself. And over the last few decades, feminism and other progressive movements have gotten tremendous mainstream attention, to the point it is almost impossible to ignore. On top of that, now is probably the first time in history that white people are being racialized. They have to be careful of the things they say. They have to make sure that they are anonymous on that group chat filled with racist and sexist conversations. They are finally being held accountable through social repercussions. On the large scope of things, having a few white people fired or getting cancelled on Twitter may not account too much, especially when they still hold most of the power in society. As Kimmel goes on to say how white people have the unique privilege of being able to travel to any time in history where they will always have a table for you. Now the table is still there, they may even get the top seat on that table, but it has just been expanded on for more seats so that everyone could have a spot on that table. Their spot is not being compromised because of this, but as the saying goes, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Ultimately, it is a lot easier to dunk on feminist women and other minorities than it is to take on the top 1% of the world, so it essentially is a cop-out. But like most evils in the world, the origins of manosphere comes from a place of genuine concern that the state of modern masculinity is under crisis. While there is some truth to that, the reality is, under late capitalism, everyone is screwed over. The middle class is shrinking, wealth inequality is more rampant than ever. The world is just really shitty right now, and you are allowed to be angry. In fact, I'll go as far as to say that you have the right to be angry, but you're just angry at the wrong people. Part 5. What now? So we spoke about grieved entitlement, the masculinity crisis, and how the manosphere really exploits this alienation and isolation that men face for their own financial and personal gain. Now, I guess all there is left to talk about is what do we actually do about this? What do we do about the men? Well, I don't know. Who do you think I am? In all seriousness, though, I don't think I am the person to tell people what can or should be done about this. Because the root cause of this issue seems to be a lack of productive masculine role models that these men could follow and look up to, over the years there has been plenty, plenty of content dunking on the manosphere, and while I don't have anything against that, I think the most absurd and ludicrous parts of the movement needs to be called out for sure, but I do have concerns that it may not be the best way to address the root cause of this issue that there is a sea of young, misguided men 
who need help and guidance to get back on the right path. We can ban Andrew Tate and figures like him all we want, but if the issue is not addressed, soon there will be others taking his place looking to get famous and make quick money given the way the algorithm favors reactionary content. And some of these men are so desperate for a male role model to look up to, they will just take what they can get. Thankfully, there has been an emergence of masculine creators making content that sometimes directly address this issue. The men's lip subreddit is a good place to start as well, but as a whole, especially on the left, it is still lacking and needs a lot more attention. On a broader sense, the performance of masculinity as we know it is not working in the 21st century. Most men do not know how to perform masculinity without its toxic and destructive aspects. If they happen to do so, they are often belittled and treated as if there was something wrong with them by both men and women alike. They are really in a catch-22 situation where on one hand they are encouraged to express emotions and express their softer side, but once they do, more often than not, their masculinity is questioned and demeaned because of it. It is a deep-rooted issue that requires structural systemic change, and people have all sorts of ideas as to how to go on about it. Some say that we should get rid of gender binary altogether and instead raise children as gender neutral raise them as a baby, use their them pronouns, have them dress the way they want, play with whatever toys they want, and really leave it up to them to figure out who they truly are without any external societal pressure. Others want to redefine masculinity to be more appropriate for the 21st century. The film Everything Everywhere All At Once, directed by The Daniels, attempts to do so with Waymond Wong, played by Gateway Kwan. The film initially portrays Waymond as this incompetent, effeminate, but kind-hearted man that can easily be overlooked by the audience. But as the film goes on, it is his kindness that is proved to be his strength, as behind the scenes, he proactively confesses with the IRS agent to give them another chance at submitting their audit. For the final conflict in the movie, Waymond doesn't fight with his fist, Rather, he fights with kindness and empathy, thus further challenging the myopic stereotypical portrayal of masculinity in Hollywood. As this Slate article goes on to say, Waymond, or any Asian character, doesn't have to be reduced to any one thing, just like white male leads never have to be limited to one specific characteristic. He can be anything and everything all at once. However, given the state of masculinity, I do have my doubts as to how realistic it may be for most men to adopt and be comfortable with this style of masculinity, and the traits that are commonly associated with masculinity like confidence, assertiveness, strength, they aren't inherently negative. Rather, it is when they are taken to the extreme is when they can be toxic and destructive. So I do wonder for the time being, if it is possible for men to perform these traits but have them in check so that they are not taken to the extreme. You know, have a fight club if you want, which is essentially a safe space for men to vent out their frustration, but have it regulated so that it doesn't turn into something destructive like Project Mayhem. But that again would require guidance and support from men who have been there, who can warn others from going down the destructive path. However, one of the main reasons as to why Fight Club led to Project Mayhem is that after the Fight Club, the men still had to go back to their mind-numbing, dead-end jobs. It was an escape from the soul-crushing, alienating system, but escaping can only take you so far. Ultimately, the real killer is patriarchy. And I know people don't usually like hearing about this. The manosphere especially tries to put blame onto women for every man's issues. But the thing is, it was never really about men versus women, rather everyone versus the patriarchy. But you know, that doesn't get the clicks, the engagement and sell courses so we don't really hear about it. In fact, I guarantee that the second some people even hear the word patriarchy, they'll just tune out and click off even if everything they're about to hear is something they'll fully agree with otherwise. If you're a guy who's still watching this, well, firstly, thanks for making it this far into the video. If there is one thing I would want you to take away from this is that you are not alone. 
no matter where you are, whether you are someone who is doing pretty well for themselves yet are feeling somewhat dissatisfied or you're feeling insecure of your masculinity and are looking up to figures like Andrew Tate and the Joker, it's okay. It really is. You're not alone. Your pain is not unique. And just go hug your bros. Seriously, whenever you're watching this, I declare today to be hug a bro day. Hug your bros. Tell your homies you love them. It's okay, it does not make you gay, not that there's anything wrong with that. The world is a fucked up place, but at least we still have each other. Or don't, I don't know. Instead, just leave a comment maybe, calling me a blue-pilled soy boy cuck, or worse, a normie.